important fundamental understanding that the average um, concept of zero-point fields basically have this extra radiation reaction uh, that's an integral part of it. <clears throat> and we discover many other phenomenal fields and uh, related um, interesting applications for it just from looking at the discoveries that are being made literally day by day. Um, this particular one, as a matter of fact, is showing a practical application that's dealing with motion. And I was fascinated to read, once again, as I uh, warned you, that the standard literature is now catching up to the uh, concepts that um, we're basically dealing with a, uh, an emerging technology of energy that no longer can be attributed to being conventional. Uh, Dr. Fiegel is the um, inventor of this concept of applying motion from the zero-point vacuum. And it basically uses the polarization of the vacuum. Whenever you polarize something, you're introducing an electric field. And the electric field basically allows for a particular direction. A strong electric field and strong magnetic field perpendicular, using Lenz's law, for example, um, Lorentz force, rather, would uh, interpret and demand uh, of a velocity that's in the third axis, perpendicular to both of them. And that's exactly the way Dr. Fiegel proposes to get motion directly from the zero-point field. And presumably this would apply to charged particles, but he uh, actually says in the literature that it applies to dielectric substances. And once again, we're looking at the free energy concept. This is Nature magazine that I'm quoting from. And in fact, it's um, a very recent Nature magazine as well. I might as well. Nature, February 2004. And it's called Mo Movement from Nothing. Now the quote is, the whole idea of getting movement from nothing sounds like a gift to advocates of the perpetual motion machines. <laughs> Nature magazine, man. But there's nothing in Fiegel's theory that violates the fundamental laws of physics. So this doesn't provide a way to cheat the universe and get free energy. <laughs> We're a threat to the establishment, I guess. <laughs> but really what he's saying there isn't true. Because Fiegel is cheating the universe and getting free energy, but he's doing it in a way that's allowable. And that's really what we're all about, is to find ways that you can cheat, maneuver the rules, and, uh, and as I'll show you, even perpetual motion's now crumbling. Uh, two out of three correlates of the perpetual motion um, rules are, are now being violated. And so here we're looking at uh, 50 microns per second. It's actually several centimeters per hour. Um, it really applies to nanotechnology. And what I find is that nanotechnology is a huge field. Uh, I've attended one of the industrial meetings at a, a legal firm that hosts these monthly. And there's lots of entrepreneurs who are just begging to invest in nanotechnology because they're seeing it as the wave of the future. Uh, we're going to have nano t nanobots everywhere. You know, go, go see iRobot if you want to get an image of what macroscopic things could happen. But microscopic things are already happening. And what I find very uh, um, disturbing is that the nanotechnology field is expanding. There's lots of little motors that work just for molecular machines, and yet they have no way to power them. I attended a AAAS meeting uh, of just three years ago, 2001, and the nanotechnology workshop from IBM, the IBM crew was there, with all, they had a press conference as well, and their nanotechnology lab was basically looking for a nanodiode. And that was three years ago. So what I find fascinating is that they haven't found their technology, but of course they're still building their motors. And um, it reminds me of one of the cartoons I saw where supposedly it was on a restaurant um, 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 table that they were describing a person building a, a wooden motorcycle, but it didn't have a motor. But he was predicting that he would be able to power it someday, and then he could actually... He invented the motorcycle without a motor. You know? And that's exactly what the IBM and other nanotechnology labs have done. Uh, they have motors without the power. Um, but what we're finding is that other physicists are offering the technology that they can marry with nanotech and basically get self-running devices. 
So Ophigo is the first one to use zero-point energy to satisfy energy conservation. And, and I salute him for doing that because it's always a manipulation of words. When you deal with something so fundamental that's continually in motion, has a sea of energy, and yet you're somehow saying, oh, we can't use that. You know? So the application of the laws and explaining how zero-point energy can be biased. That's what these electric and magnetic fields do, is bias the vacuum so it can only move and oscillate and randomly fluctuate just in one direction. And, uh, and then he basically biases the blue and red arrows so he gets simply one direction off. In fact, this is the momentum difference <clears throat> for dielectric uh, material. And we're talking about, for the uh, uh, scientific crowd, the 100 kilovolts per meter, which is not tremendously high, and also 17 tesla, or about 170 kilogauss. Now, 2004, I'll tell you, this year is probably the one of the best years for zero-point energy I've ever seen. Would you believe in Aviation Week and Space Technology, uh, March 1st, 2004, we get a whole article, which of course Hal Putoff sends me two copies of, <laughs> making sure I, I know it's getting recognized. Um, that's the only time I hear from Hal Putoff when he's got a new publication that says how great he is. But, um, but here's the subtitle for Zero Point Energy Emerges and Maybe the Key to Deep Space Travel. Now, I've already shown you one experiment that's proposing a way to induce motion on a subatomic or nanotechnology scale. But now we're describing, you know, can you get hypersonic speeds and uh, miles you know, per second and 1,200 seats in your hypersonic flyer? <clears throat> and also, in the meantime, we want to extract energy as we do it. <laughs> we don't want to just put it on board as a gasoline engine and hope we burn our way to Mars you know, or to the next star. That's what NASA is doing now. I, I went to a NASA meeting, for example, where they're talking about destroying the shuttle, and they have nothing to replace it. And of course, there's all kinds of other depressing things about NASA too. But um, it, it's a, it's up to a lot of other folks and scientists to say, yes, we do have prototypes, we have discoveries, we can engineer this stuff, and now is the time for government grants to get together. And, and luckily, Dr. Mile is a good example. Um, who's already been acknowledged by the Department of Energy, and he'll be giving a seminar, I believe, um, is it this uh, coming month? Oh, okay. But I, I was understanding that uh, at least the government here in the United States is perhaps arranging a seminar from you. And I see. Great. Well, we'll look forward to that. Because they, they need to be educated. Our government's in the 20th century, which is uh, old technology. So here I'm proposing, and this is a very conceptual issue. And we have two problems here that this article proposes. Not only motion, but I want energy too. And that's why our nonprofit Ener uh, institute is devoted to energy and propulsion. Because in every experiment, you'll find that they're both related. And if you get one, you might as well get the other. Um, because you're going to need them. And, and you can't imagine traveling in space without both. Onboard, convertible, as you need it, without heavy weights of who knows what. Uh, I saw a science program just this last week where this guy was proposing an inflatable inner tube that he's going to put um, moon ice in to be able to burn a steam engine on his way to Mars. <laughs> I thought it was the best invention I ever, just, uh, you know, whatever. So... But good luck to him. So now we get to the more practical physics of zero-point energy. How do we really get powerful motion that applies fluid dynamics to things that your school teachers never taught you? My stepson says that his um, physics professors elucidate the physics that he learns. And I said, did they tell you about quantum entanglement or quantum teleportation? No. <laughs> So the elucidation process is definitely needed here. Um, hydrodynamic model of vehicle interactions with the zero-point field. Now that's a mouthful, but hydrodynamic is basically fluid dynamics. Let's look at sound. If we look at subsonic sound, subsonic flight, for years 
the speed of sound basically was a barrier. 